Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between people and animals in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll learn the meaning of natural horsemanship while watching two top equine trainers in a competition. Then we'll meet a Rottweiler named Max, whose life depends on him learning right from wrong. Plus, find out if the Corgi is the right breed for your family, and it's all about the breed. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. Hawaii has a rich history when it comes to horsemanship. Starting with the Paniolas of the 1800s, horsemanship has grown and evolved. And even if it's a centuries old trade, there are still techniques to be learned. So today I'm over here at the Hawaii Colt Starting Challenge, and this is natural horsemanship training. Natural horsemanship is also called horse whispering. Trainers using this technique don't use physical force to break an untrained horse. Instead, they try to be as gentle as possible, using the horse's natural instincts to help in the training. And in some cases, the horses are raised to mimic life in the wild. So what the horsemen do is get uh, the horse to understand that the horseman is the leader. So the two horses today that these trainers are using have never been saddled, bridled, or had a blanket on their back. Other methods of training can be tough on a horse, tying its legs, blindfolding it to get control. Natural horsemanship is the complete opposite, but it reaches the same goal. Now, let's see how it's done by two trainers in a challenge. So these two trainers, Dan Olson and Russell Beatty, are up against a big challenge because normally you train a horse, it takes at least two weeks to about a month, and these guys are out here doing it in a little less than two days, with only two hours each day. People, they don't get respect out of their horses, and the horses just push on them. So I always want them to stay back off me. Russell is a pro when it comes to training horses. A Maui resident, he's been training since he was 10 and has taken part in more than 100 Colt Challenge events. So at the end of this of today, what we're supposed to be able to do is to take our horses, ride them. We're gonna be able to walk, trot, and run. Daniel is also an old pro. He grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming and now works as a farrier, someone who specializes in caring for horses' hooves. He also trains horses that are difficult to work with. They're actually training these horses in less than a couple of days. Um, these horses here have less than three hours of ride time and they're already on their back today. This is day two of the competition. We're about two hours in on this event and we're breaking everything down. We're setting up the obstacle course. So far it seems that Russell has been able to get quite a bit more forward movement out of his horse. He's been able to walk, trot and canter pretty fine. Dan's groundwork has been excellent. He's done a great job. I am a little concerned because he hasn't quite yet gotten his horse to canter. So we'll go ahead and see how he does during the obstacle course. The real challenge in, um, outside of this round pen is when these two trainers actually will ride these two horses in an obstacle course away outside of the round pen, no walls, no structures or obstacles. So at this part of the competition is where it kind of gets to the nitty gritty and I feel like I'm pretty well ready to do it. Now the competition starts. Dan is first. The competition consists of a series of exercises designed to challenge the horses. Horses scare easily, so if the horse doesn't trust a rider, doing the obstacles will be difficult. But Dan is doing a good job. Russell's up, but it's a bumpy start. He has some trouble getting up on his horse as the horse takes a nip at him. But after some gentle prodding, Russell gains some ground and is able to take to the course. Now for the winner. So the winner of the Hawaiian Colt Starting Challenge on Oahu is Daniel Olson. So Daniel, what'd you think? Oh, it was fun, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. This was 
Both men proved that even with so little time, natural horsemanship works. There's an old saying we've all heard, sweating like a pig. But some people say that pigs don't sweat at all. So why that saying? We'll find out right after this. Do pigs sweat? Well, they do sweat a little, but not nearly enough to cool off those large bodies. That's why they love to wallow in the mud. It cools them off like sweat would if they had enough. So where does the saying come in, sweat like a pig? Well, it's not about pigs at all. The saying originated with the manufacture of pig iron, which is a form of iron made when the ore is melted at extremely high temperatures. As it cools, the air around it reaches the dew point, forming droplets on the metal that look like sweat. So next time you're hot and the perspiration is plentiful, just say you're sweating like pig iron. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest, the Chihuahua, to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the Welsh Corgi. Originally from Wales, there are actually two dogs that go by the name Corgi, the Pembroke Welsh Corgi and the Cardigan Corgi. Both are separate and distinct breeds. Of the two, the most popular is the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Considered the 11th most intelligent dog, the Welsh Corgi is an ancient breed, dating back as far as the 10th century when records indicate that they were used to herd sheep, geese, ducks, horses, and cattle. So obviously they're one of the oldest of the herding breeds. There's also a popular folk legend that says corgis were a gift from woodland fairies and that the markings on their back were the result of the tiny saddles used by the fairies to ride them. As old as the breed is, their ability as herders has carried through the years, and even today they are considered one of the best herders. They excel as healers, which means that they nip at the heels of cattle to keep them moving. They're very agile dogs. You can see that when they're herding, but that trait also makes them excel in competition, in obedience, showmanship, fly ball, tracking, and herding events. Corgis were even used at one time to guard children, but it isn't clear if they actually herded them. As for popularity, corgis are well known to hobnob with royalty. Queen Elizabeth has owned more than 30, either Pembroke Welsh corgis or a corgi dachshund mix. She was given her first corgi by her father when she was seven. Its name was Dookie. Young Elizabeth chose Dookie out of the litter because he had a longer tail. She said that having a long tail would make it easier for her to know if he was pleased or not. Welsh corgis were first brought to the U.S. in 1933 by a breeder in Massachusetts. They were recognized by the AKC the following year. As for size, male corgis weigh an average of 30 pounds, females about 25. They come in red, sable, tan, fawn, and black, and may or may not have the white markings. As for health issues, they are generally a healthy breed and have an average lifespan of just over 12 years. They are prone to some cancer and kidney problems, as well as some types of eye conditions, including progressive retinal atrophy. Hip dysplasia among corgis is rare. Corgis love physical activity and need regular exercise. They're strong and athletic and are happiest when they've got a job to do. Some corgis are barkers. They're best suited to temperate climates if they're going to be outdoors, but they make great indoor pets. They need brushing only once a week or so. They make great companions. Just ask the queen. And now you know all about the corgi. There's a really spooky thing that cats do in the dark that you've probably seen. Their eyes appear to glow. It always looks like Halloween when they appear that way, but are their eyes really glowing? What makes their eyes look like that? We'll tell you right after this. You've seen it. In the darkness, a cat's eyes will glow and look really creepy. But their eyes aren't really glowing at all. The reason that they look like that is a special reflective layer in their eyes called the tapetum lucidum. This special layer permits their eyes to see better in low light situations because it sends more light to the retina. 
Because it's dark and because cats have proportionally larger eyes than we do, the glowing effect, which scientists call eye shine, is much more pronounced. And if you're wondering, yes, dogs and some other animals have the same reflective layer and their eyes appear to glow in the dark as well. There's nothing as special and rewarding as the love of a good dog. For centuries, they've provided people with affection and companionship. On occasion, however, man's best friend can sometimes become his greatest enemy. This story is about Max, a good-hearted Rottweiler who made a bad choice, and now his life depends on learning right from wrong. So Max's mom and dad reached out to me because Max got himself into a lot of trouble. And we're gonna start his initial training this morning. We're gonna do a little bit of evaluations with him and see exactly where he stands, what his naughty behaviors are, and what he needs the most help with so that we can focus his training towards those versus spending time on things we don't really need to focus on. Rottweilers are inclined toward dominance and will test for position in the family pecking order. Without ongoing socialization and obedience training, they can prove to be too much dog for many households. Clearly, this is the case for Max's family, which is why his training will either make or break his future. All right, so we're gonna walk up to some of our trainers over here just hanging out, show that Max can actually go around a group of people. He's not gonna be bothered by it. Let's see, if, does he even care at all? I'm gonna say hi, bud. Good job, good job. All right, go ahead and stand up. All right, so now they went from a, a less threatening position to a more threatening position by standing up and being taller and bigger than him. Real still doesn't really seem to care. He's just kind of hanging out. So. All right, guys, you guys want to like space out and we'll go through the rest of this? So far, Max has shown no hostility in this training session, but his previous actions have come with some heartache. He has recently shown signs of increased agitation and aggression. Uh, the day that Max got in trouble, they were all outside and the gate didn't quite shut well and Max came Max. out of the yard Come here, Max. and dad and grandpa and son were all running around trying to catch him. Um, in the meantime, the neighbor came out and was upset because he is a Rottweiler and they tend to be scary dogs because of their reputation. The neighbor came out, started yelling, Max turned around and ran and bit the neighbor. Whenever they went to court, they were given options, pay the fine and put the dog down pay the fine and find the dog a new home, or they could pay the fine and they requested training, and the court system actually agreed to allow them to come in training. Max needs to comply with the terms set by the court and complete training. He needs to show he is worth through his aggression. But in order to do so, Erica needs to find Max's trigger and just what makes him bite. All right, so I'm gonna walk Max over by one of our first people and throw in one of the scenarios where we're gonna see how he responds to it. Go ahead, he's right by you. Get away from me, get your dog away from me. So she's acting a little bit more fearful trying to get away from him, giving some loud voices and throwing her hands up. He doesn't really seem to care. Ryan's gonna be a little bit more threatening to see if Max is gonna show any of those aggressive signs. Max. All right, so basically the... Ah. All right, so what happened right there is whenever Brian put his hand down on Max's face around his mouth, he didn't really like that, and he turned around and he tagged Brian in the hand to let him know, hey, buddy, I don't really like that. So this is one of those aggressive behaviors that Max has that we want to be able to work out of him throughout his two weeks of training. I did something he didn't like uh, and received a notification of that via, uh, via Max here. Um, so there's different levels of aggression with dogs and whatnot, um, and that's something he didn't enjoy. Uh, I just kind of pushed his face. He let me do it twice with just a warning. Uh, I came back for one more, and he let me know that it was it was game time. So. Well, we just finished the evaluation, and I definitely can tell I've got my work cut out with him. Max clearly has some aggression issues, but hopefully now that Erica has an idea of what his triggers are, she might have a chance to save his life. When we return, we'll find out if an old dog can learn new tricks or if it's the end of the road for Mad Max. You've probably heard that dogs can't see in color, that they see everything in black and white. But is that really true? We'll find out right after this. Is it a myth that dogs see everything in black and white? The answer is a qualified no. It turns out that dogs can see some color. 
Human eyes contain three different kinds of cones, those receptors that distinguish color. Dogs have only two of these cones, and scientists at the University of Washington discovered that they can't detect shades of red or green, but they can see shades of blue and yellow. Dogs use the variations in shades and brightness of blue and yellow to distinguish between items. So they may see the world differently than we do, but at least it's not all black and white. For the last week, Erica has been working hard with Max to identify what makes Max so mad. She needs to help him work through his aggression so he can continue living his life back home. So Max is a nervous dog. Uh, so anytime something changes in his environment or he gets nervous, he's instinctually gonna jump into fight or flight. Off, sit. So whenever his nerves pick up, he just wants to go and either defend himself or run away from it. In the event that he can't run away from it, he's gonna attack it. Sit. One of the best kept secrets in dog training is the use of elevated areas. This helps to define space, keeping the dog in one place and making it easier to focus on their trainer. Erica goes through okay. a series of exercises in hopes to desensitize Max to the things that set him off. She hones in on his facial area because that was the place the trainer touched earlier and then got bit. In the event that he does have a negative behavior, he does something naughty like jumps or gets out of his position or barks or growls, then we use the e-collar. Um, it's a muscle stimulation tool that lets me communicate with him to let him know that, hey, that's unacceptable, that's not right, um, that's, you know, fix this problem. And then we go right back into having him hold his position and then he gets praised at the end of it because that was very hard for him. The e-collar is widely used by trainers, especially with dogs like Max with a history of aggression. Some critics argue that e-collars should not be used because they inflict some degree of pain. While this debate continues, it's important to remember that the electric stimulus is actually very mild, and in many instances, it can be the difference between failure and saving a dog's life. Okay, so I'll show you an example on how it works. Max down, one push of the button, it sends a low level stimulation to his neck where the collar is secured, um, letting him know Good that, boy. hey, we need to pay attention, you need to do what you need to do. And it's just a matter of communicating with him in another means that's been super awesome and beneficial for Max. Erica is bringing Max into new environments and situations to take him out of his comfort zone and to continue desensitizing him. But the most important test is about to come. We know Max doesn't like his face being touched, but the only way to see if Max has made real progress is to reenact the scenario. But is he ready? Mission accomplished. It seems Mad Max does have a soft side after all. While the techniques and training Max has received are leading to better outcomes, it remains to be seen if he will continue to do the same for his owners. So today's a really big day for Max. He's gonna go home for his first time after his 14 day training program with us. He did come for our board and train. Uh, he did the special on-leash version specifically catered to Max. Uh, we're headed out to Capulani Park right now to do a little bit of practice and meet up with his family and go over everything we're going to need to go over so that they can continue to practice with him over the next week and a half. Uh, and then we're going to get Max back for a little bit longer and do some more socialization training and his training is just going to continue to be an ongoing process to get him on the right path. Go say hi to your mom. His mom's here now and he's gonna get ready to go oh, home. Good, First mom. portion of our training is to train mom how to use the remote in the collar system. Yeah. This is the collar, the remote um, system. Comes in the box, so you get to keep the box. Don't After worry going it. over the tools and training oh, Max has received, his owner expresses so some hesitation so about person. using the e-collar on him. Since it has proven to be a very effective tool for Max, Erica offers her a demonstration to help put her at ease. And now you're gonna tell me whenever you feel something. This will not hurt, okay? I feel a little, yeah. The little tingles? A little tingles. Max's owner realizes it's a small amount of discomfort for a big reward in making Max a law-abiding citizen. So Max's mom is gonna have Max back home for about two weeks. Uh, she's now got the tools to continue training and practicing with him to get him on, continue on the right path. Max has the tools and the foundation established to be successful. So at this point, it's gonna be up to Max's mom and the time and dedication um, and how much practice her and Max get in over this next two weeks to see where he's at.
Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We're going to explore a sport that has old roots, but is again gaining popularity, the sport of dog karting. We'll follow a young Rottweiler's first attempts at karting and see how it goes. Then we'll take a look at one of the most popular breeds of cats in the world, the Siamese. If you've considered getting a Siamese, you should be aware of their unusual characteristics. Then we'll witness the unbreakable bond between a stray dog and a golf course maintenance worker. From being rescued to becoming part of the working crew, this dog has found his forever family. It's all ahead on Pets in Paradise TV. Karting is a competitive sport where a dog pulls a cart full of supplies, such as firewood or farming equipment, and sometimes even people. It's practiced around the world, often to keep winter sled dogs in top shape during the off season. The Rottweiler was originally bred to take things to market. So the butcher would sit on the cart, take the dog and all his meat or his milk and whatever he was doing down to the market, and then he would sell it there and come home and the great thing about the Rottweiler is he could put his change purse around his neck and it was safe to go. So they are inherently a carting dog. It is what they were, one of their purposes they were bred for. I'm gonna get Lana out of her crate. Okay, I'm getting ready to start with my dog now, my younger dog that has no carting experience and is very fearful of things um, behind her. I haven't been able to do it on my own. Uh, I don't have enough um, help. Now I have knowledgeable people to help me. The skilled trainers are helping Lana get used to the cart behind her without having to actually pull it. Yes, that's my good girl. They're gonna touch it. Yep, good girl. You got the other leash to put on her. Now that Lana is more comfortable with the cart, the trainers are attaching it to her for the next phase. It can be uncomfortable at first, but they're supporting the cart to make it lighter and easier for Lana to turn. Bring it around so the shafts are straight behind her. Oh, sit. God, don't break your legs. Sit. Lana, sit. Good girl. Okay, so now what we've done is we've created a safe spot for her. They reward her with praises yeah. and treats, which goes a long way. Good girl, good, good girl. girl. That's, That's a good, good job. Girl. She is doing better than I ever dreamed she'd be able to do because she is a very skittish dog about things behind her and um, things that suddenly touch her. So this is instincts are taking over and she's doing her job. Right turn. Dogs instinctually like to pull things, which makes them perfect to help around the farm and to assist with transportation. But most dogs need to be trained, and the learning curve varies. My dog Mina generally is a nervous type of dog. She doesn't like anything new. She doesn't like new experiences. She doesn't like noisy, uh, any kind of noisy contraptions. So I thought it would be a great idea for her to come out and. Um, try carting. I walked with the cart right behind me next to her and she seemed okay, she didn't seem nervous. But it didn't take long for things to turn south with this new experience. Stay tuned to see if Nina's carting instinct kicked in or if she's just had enough of this sport. Because of the Rottweiler's low center of gravity and strong legs, this breed has been helping humans pull heavy things for hundreds of years. But there's another breed with a similar body build that's growing in popularity in pulling competitions. The Pitbull is one of the more popular dogs when it comes to weight pulling competition. They've been known to pull 10 to 20 times their own body weight, and some dog owners actually treat their dogs like athletes. They undergo special training and workouts to make sure there aren't any injuries. What makes these dogs want to pull such heavy weights? It's simply the love they have for their owners. Rottweilers were bred to be carting dogs, 
Dogs were used and are still used to help transport goods to the market, around the farm, or to pull sleds. While it's an enjoyable sport for most dogs, some would prefer running free. Let's see how Nina is doing after her first day at karting. So we try to correct her obedience to make her to stay. Taking it one step at a time, Nina managed to overcome her fear. The food definitely helped serve as a motivation and the patience paid off for all these trainers. We were able to just slowly, one step at a time, get her to walk with the cart uh, attached to her. So she was still nervous, but um, she was able to walk with it. Although Nina needs more practice, she's completed the hardest hurdle, and it will likely be smoother from here. The next Rottweiler we're going to see is an experienced service dog. Let's put his karting skills to the test. Oh, he's going to help me with um, balance and mobility uh, as a service dog. Hazmat is going to learn karting for some real-world experience in the workplace. And I thought that I could put um, the material or equipment that I have in the carts and then can help me transport it to the classrooms. And of course, bring a smile to the children's face at school. Teresa, the trainer, got Hazmat and I comfortable enough. I was able to sit down in the cart and he was able to pull me in the cart and that was, that was in a way, it was a little scary because I wasn't sure how he was gonna be, if he was gonna get a little skittish, but he did so well. And it was actually fun to be pulled in a cart, not by a horse, but my own dog. So that was fun. Carting can be for dogs of all breeds and sizes. This is Boomer. He's a long-haired dachshund, two and a half years old, male. He's a rescue dog. I've had him for about a year and a half. Boomer may be too small to pull a person, but as you can see, he has an enormous will and heart. Today's our first time karting. We're trying to learn something new to give him something to do. Whoops, we're going right out of the harness. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, partially handicapped. He has hearing impairment. He's not completely deaf, but he has a deaf, certain de hearing deficit. Although some may see his hearing impairment as a disadvantage, it was likely an advantage to Boomer, who couldn't hear the cart rattling behind him. The noise of the cart can be startling to many dogs, but it didn't bother Boomer. He was a little bit nervous at the beginning. This cart for his size dog is rather heavy. Um, the ones that the big dogs are pulling by proportion to their body weight are rather light. The homemade cart that we're pulling is rather heavy for his body size. He's only 10 pounds. So I think that had an effect on what he was able to do out there. He's not used to pulling that weight. Karting can be a great sport for dogs from all walks of life, not to mention a fun and helpful skill to have. Whether they do it competitively or just for fun, it's enjoyable for the whole family. <laughs> if you're a cat owner, you probably have tried to teach your cat some tricks but learning new skills varies from breed to breed. Do you know which cats are easiest to train? The top five breeds of cats that are easiest to train are the Abyssinian, the American or domestic shorthair, the Bengal, the Savannah, and in fifth place, a breed we're going to find out more about in the next story, the Siamese. The Siamese cat originated in Thailand, which used to be Siam, and there are two versions. The original breed, which is known as a Thai cat, and the modern Siamese cat, which was bred from the Thai cat. They're sometimes called Neezers. The Thai cat has features that are considered old style, with a more rounded head and body than the modern Siamese, which has a triangular head shape, large ears, and an elongated muscular body and coloration at its points. The original Thai cat is a very old breed and is thought to have been around since the 14th century. It's been mentioned in literature throughout history, but became mainstream when it was introduced to England in the late 1800s. Breeding to established desired characteristics resulted in the Siamese that we know today. But the International Cat Association and other cat organizations recognize both the Siamese and the Thai cat. The markings of the Siamese are quite interesting. The pointed pattern is caused by a mutated enzyme that is heat sensitive which means that the parts of the cat's body that are cooler develop the darker coloration, like the ears and face. The distinctive coloration starts appearing several weeks after birth, 
and gets darker as the cat ages. Siamese cats living in warm climates have lighter coats than those who live in cold climates. The colorations include seal point, blue point, chocolate point, and lilac point. All Siamese have blue eyes. Siamese cats are very intelligent and affectionate and are one of the few breeds that will fetch objects like dogs. They want to be near people or other cats and are known to fall into depression if left alone for long periods of time. Breeders like to sell them in pairs so they keep each other company. The lifespan of a Siamese, unfortunately, is shorter than other breeds. The median lifespan is between 10 and 12 and a half years. As for health problems, many Siamese suffer from mammary tumors and urinary tract infections. Asthma and bronchial disease, as well as heart problems, are also common. They're also often cross-eyed, a condition related to the enzyme that causes their point coloration, but they focus just fine. Siamese are considered easy to groom. They shed less than other breeds. Their personality is distinctive in the cat world. Not only do they fetch, but they're also talkative and opinionated. They're socially demanding, and anyone considering a Siamese must be willing to spend more time with them than with other breeds. Siamese are best as house cats. If allowed to go outdoors, they're susceptible diseases, just like other cats. But Siamese can also be the victims of being stolen by people who want a beautiful cat without paying for it. If you're considering a Siamese, keep in mind the personality traits. They love to talk, they love to interact, and they love to be with you all the time. And consider getting a pair. They'll be much happier with someone to play with when you run out of steam. And now you know all about the Siamese cat. There are some odd laws regarding animals and pets around the world. Which country do you think has the strangest laws? The strangest pet laws in the world have to be the ones found in Switzerland. The Swiss Animal Rights Code specifies that for certain types of pets, including hamsters, guinea pigs, mice, and ferrets, each animal must have a companion of the same kind. But what if you have two and one dies? Ah, a solution! There are businesses where you can actually rent a guinea pig or other animal so you won't go afoul of the law. This is the story about a second chance and an unbreakable bond. Tuji was a dog with no name, hurt, with a limp, hungry, thirsty, lost, abandoned. We just don't know, but now she's living a good life. first got the call on the radio that there was a loose dog in the property. And we thought it was a hunting dog. Came up the stairs and there she was lying over here. She was just timid. Um, so what I did, just pet her, let her sniff my hand and just basically introduce myself. Well, Caesar was the first to pick up Doogee from the parking lot and I think that's formed a, a bond uh, between those two. She just came up right to me, very friendly. Jumped in my golf cart and I called her over and she jumped right on. I noticed she was limping, so I was concerned she was really hurt on that. Uh, gave her some water to drink. Caesar took her back to the shop and uh, nursed her back to health, fed her and gave her water. I, I think that formed a strong bond between the two. And it, it was instant how they have a connection. Anywhere that you see Caesar within just a few yards, Doogee runs by. And anytime you see Doogee, you know Caesar's close by. It's really special, it, it's a fun event and everybody actually looks forward to seeing the two of them run around the course together. Okay, this is our golf course maintenance building here at Kola Golf Club. And this way I brought the dog once we brought it down from the clubhouse, um, just so we weren't too sure how she was gonna react to strangers and things like that. So we tied her up over here. And after a couple hours, noticed that she was very friendly to the crew, to our contractors coming in, uh, any visitors. So we just let her loose and ever since then, this is her home. From limping to running miles a day, Doogee travels the golf course with Caesar and has become somewhat of a celebrity, attracting attention from everyone on the green. But she doesn't let it get to her head. She's a working dog at heart. 
it's really up to her if she wants to ride the golf cart or not. But usually she uh, chooses to run alongside or run behind and check out what's going on in the course today. So she definitely is in great shape now. Uh, she runs anywhere from 10 to 15, 16 miles a day. Our regular guests always ask about her, how she's doing, where she's at, if she's not with me. And she's uh, very helpful for the crew. She chases the mongoose off the course, the pigs off the course. When I'm driving and she's running and uh, she has some sense of where I'm going, she knows all the shortcuts. So instead of running an extra mile and a half, she'll take that shortcut. Like for instance here, she'll cut over on this side of the green where I have to drive all the way around and she'll meet, and meet me on the other side. Suji didn't become a golf course celebrity canine overnight. It all started with a name. Uh, when we found her, we called her a dog, and uh, so I said, why don't we name her Doogee, which is D-O-G, Do, D-O, and G. So it came out with the name Doogee. First, we were really concerned where she was gonna go to the bathroom. But uh, after a while, we, really, we realized that she's not only potty trained, but golf course trained. She chases chickens around uh, <laughs> once in a while, uh, but uh, never seems to get one. But she's a good old dog. Things are going great for Doogee since the chance meeting with Caesar that turned her life around, but they did have some hard times. So about three days after we found her, uh, she had a puppy. But sadly, the puppy was a stillborn, and uh, we didn't even know she was pregnant. It was sad that the puppy didn't make it. Um, we buried the puppy out in the mountains over here. Um, but now, she's living a good life. She's very happy, she's very content. Uh, she's a sweetheart of a dog, and uh, I think she's very happy uh, staying with us and living here at the golf course. Hey, hey, is it lunchtime? Yeah, is it lunchtime? Yeah, okay. Look at that. Left over the best family to be on the island. Doogie has totally imprinted herself on Caesar. She will not do anything without his permission. She comes up here for lunch. If we're feeding her and he decides to drive off, then she's got to figure out how she's going to finish her food and run after him or just leave the food and go. Bond between her and Caesar is pretty strong. Um, you know, you can be sitting here and feeding her like this, and once Caesar gets uh, starts moving, She'll stop, she'll quit eating, and then she'll just follow Caesar to uh, wherever he's going. Everybody says, hey, your dog, how's your dog, and all that, but you know what, she adopted me. It was, uh, uh, it's a quite interesting relationship that uh, we're really bonded. If we're ever looking for Caesar, uh, we, know where to, we know where to find him. We see Doogee around, we know Caesar is uh, uh, within 100 yards. If I ever left Kolau Golf Club, of course she'd come with me wherever I went. For the folks at Ko'olau Golf Course, Duji is more than just a pet or a mascot, she's family. She even has an official ID of sorts on her collar. So at the end of the day, I close up the, the building, lock her up, put the alarms on, and close the gate. She's still able to uh, get free roam of the golf course and her surroundings. So at night, this is where she spends her night, and she spends it uh, sleeping here on uh, my cot, and in the morning she greets me when I uh, come back to work. We always wondered about her previous life, how she was raised, how she was trained, if she was around kids, what her owner was like. It would be great to find out how she lived before, because she's very much a, a, a great dog, a great companion, uh, one of those uh, dog stories that at the end always uh, jerks at your heart and puts a tear in your eye. Good night, Doogee. Be a good girl. See you tomorrow morning. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals, and what better place to do it than Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. 
We'll learn what it takes to get your dog trained to be an agility champion. Then we'll see how an ultrasound scan can help veterinarians save lives. Find out what goes on behind the scenes at a polo game. Plus, we'll learn all about the dachshund, and it's all about the breed. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. It's a growing sport for both people and their canines. It requires teamwork, speed, and most of all, agility. Agility is a sport, an athletic sport for both dogs and handlers, which is why it's fun. So there's dog training involved, as well as the athletic part of running with your dog and having a good time with your animal. In this segment, we check out the Hawaiian Agility Handlers Association in action on their training course. The dogs actually enjoy climbing on the equipment, running through the tunnels, doing the sets of weave pulls. Agility is a sport for dogs of all breeds and at all stages of learning. There's lots to learn and enjoy as both the dog and handler train to become an agility team. So it's a very participatory sport in that the dogs are having a good time right along with the handlers. Throughout the obstacle course, the handler can only use their voice, movement, and various body signals to coordinate maneuvers with their canine. You can have fun in the sport of agility with absolutely any breed. There's some that are a little bit more athletic, a little bit more built for the job, but there's no reason that anyone can't bring their dog out to a Saturday afternoon class and get involved in the sport of agility and have a really nice time. Some people do agility just for the fun and exercise. Others take it to the next level and compete against other teams. It's such a dance between you and the dog, and it's very kinesthetic sport. Um, the dog senses, and you can't be just up in your logical head. You know, once the physical conditioning and the foundation's in place, this is really what unlocks the true fun of the sport, when you can get into that zone with your dog. So Carol, let's uh, do the uh, jump to the tunnel over to the teeter-totter on this round. All right, so get her playing first. So Holly's a novice dog. She's sort of a middle range height dog. So we actually have height classes for the teeniest, tiniest little dogs all the way up to the largest dogs, as well as different performance levels. If you are considering agility training for your dog, remember that the foundation for all agility training starts with basic obedience, learning how to sit, stay, and come when called. When those are learned, you can move on to a training course where maneuvers are taught by rewards, both treats and verbal praise. And lastly, have fun. If agility training isn't fun for everybody, it's simply not going to work. So this is Christy with her German Shepherd Cyrus, and she's been involved uh, competing for about a year with her dog, sort of at the entry level. And uh, German Shepherds are well-known working dogs, but not necessarily uh, one of the more uh, seen dogs in the agility sport, but she does an incredible job with her dog. All right, let's go see if we can do a couple jumps here. Now we want Christy to go over the A-frame and approach this next big piece of contact equipment, the dog walk, and stop at the bottom. Very nice. Each obstacle course is different, but there are some universal rules. That way, the scoring of the runs is not just for time, but for skill and accuracy. So the contact equipment consists of three different pieces. This is the dog walk. We have the A-frame, which is a larger, wider board, and we have the seesaw, which actually moves. There's a yellow zone at the bottom of each one of these pieces of contact equipment, and the dog must touch at least one paw on this yellow zone. So one of the methodologies for a large dog is actually to teach them to stop in the zone with two feet on the ground and two feet on the board. Ready, steady! Ready, steady! Okay, go see this is Les and his dog, JJ, a Shetland Sheepdog. JJ is one of Hawaii's top competitors and is now competing across the United States. What makes Les and JJ a very competitive team 
is the dog has a lot of speed and enthusiasm. You see she's playing with the toy. Uh, Les is athletic and the dog is athletic. So she's got trainability, she's smart, and she's athletic, and that puts together a very nice agility team. Teamwork is vital in this sport. If a handler can effectively direct their dog around the new course accurately, they can avoid getting penalties on their score. As you can see, her athletic ability takes her up and over those contacts as fast as she can be. And then the precision of making sure she gets a contact zone. This is freestyle. So he's not actually following a course, he's just training his dog over the A-frame, over the jump. So this is what we do sort of on a weekly or a monthly basis with our dogs. We just got done running with JJ on an agility course. Uh, we do the try this once a week. It's very good exercise and it's great team building with her and she's a great dog to play with. In the end, it's about having fun, the team spirit and camaraderie. This agility community is really, is really a community. The handlers are all look out for each other. They participate together. They're a small knit group uh, and it's like one of the most friendly, wonderful places for me to come and teach every single year. Do you know which of the following animals sleeps the most? A python, a domestic house cat, a brown bat? We'll tell you the answer right after this. Up next, we find out how veterinarians are using ultrasound scans to save lives. If you're a cat owner, you probably think it sleeps more than any other animal on Earth. But no, cats are actually down the list at 15 hours a day. A python sleeps 18 a day, but it's the brown bat that takes the record, sleeping an average of 19.9 hours a day. That's a lot of hanging around. And now, more Pets in Paradise TV. Okay, so we're on our way. First patient of the day is going to be a cardiac study. We're going to Ohana Pet. And I'm not really sure if we're doing a dog or a cat, but we are going to image the heart. This is Leo Stewart. She's a registered diagnostic medical stenographer. We're going to see what her day is like scanning pets. When I originally started my business, the ultrasound machine weighed about 450 pounds. And now it's eight pounds. And this is the machine, it's about $45,000. An ultrasound exam is a way of looking inside your pet's body without having to perform surgery. It sends sound waves into the body, then uses the echoes to create an image. Hi, Mina. I'm Leo. Leo's gonna do our ultrasound. Leo. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna put some gel on his skin, get him a little wet, and we're gonna put his head on the white towel. Nalo is a black lab who has been experiencing shortness of breath and anxiousness. They're hoping an ultrasound will reveal if anything is going on internally. And the machine will tell us how well the heart is functioning. We were told that um, labs have um, heart murmurs. It's normal for them to have this problem. But we're kind of getting some irregular tones there and have a little scratchy sound. This tells us the heart beats a little bit faster than what we like to see for larger dogs. Leo is studying the different colors to examine the blood flow in Nalo's heart. The results look concerning. And we have a valve that's leaking a little bit here, so we get this mosaic of color. Gathering high-resolution images is just the first step in finding answers for what's ailing Nalo. And so we'll send those images out. The specialist will let us know what their recommendations are for this pet. Nalo has been coming here since he was six weeks old. So I'm hopeful that we can find some kind of medication for him so he can live out his normal doggy life the best way possible. Bye, Nala. Okay, bye, Nala. Bye, Nala. See you later. Ultrasound imaging options. Um, I could probably be there in about 20 minutes. I'm on the road right now. The need for ultrasounds is in demand. So we just added on another patient. Leo's schedule changes by the hour. And now she's heading to Aloha Animal Hospital to help a very uncomfortable collie. 
Looks like this pet came in not eating well. They did an exam, they could palpate something in the abdomen. So we're gonna do the ultrasound to see if there's a mass on any of the organs or what that lump that they felt might be. And we're gonna put the dog on the table. My name is Dr. Douglas Chang here at Aloha Animal Hospital and if you think I'm looking like I'm in pain, it's because I am. And it's because of this dog uh, bit me the other day. Um, what happened was we lifted up the tail to find get a temperature and the dog was really painful and, and bit us. Further exam, we found that uh, the reason that this dog presented for not eating and uh, not feeling well is, is that he's got a big mass in the caudal or the back part of his abdomen yeah. and it looks like it's involving the nerves that supply the bladder and the anus as well as the tail. So we're doing an ultrasound as a non-invasive way to look in there and hopefully get more information so that we can make a more intelligent decision about the diagnosis and its treatment. Ultrasound is just one picture of the big puzzle. So we have to put all this information back together with the x-rays to determine what's really going on with the pet. The ultrasound is showing that there is a mass in his testicle and spleen. The prognosis is not good, but at least there are now answers as to why he is so uncomfortable and a starting point of how to bring him back to health. Okay, so we just left Aloha Animal Hospital, and now we're on our way to Feather and Fur Animal Clinic in Kailua. Leo is going to check in on one of her feline friends who is recovering from liver surgery. Okay, so we're getting ready to do an ultrasound. It's on a cat. So this is Stinky Boo Boo. He's a 10-year-old diabetic cat, and he's been um, vomiting. So we had ultrasounded his pancreas to see what was going on. And when we were doing that, we saw that he had a tumor or a small spot in his liver, and it slowly grew, and so we biopsied it, and it turned out that it was indeed a tumor. So we scheduled him for surgery, removed that lobe of his liver, and today we're doing a follow-up exam to see if, any, um, if there's any signs of the tumor coming back. Looks like good news. All the liver tissue looks normal. Lucky for Stinky Boo Boo, his tumor appears to have been completely intercepted and there is no indication it's coming back. Today ended on a happy note. We have a success story here with Boo Boo. And he has a bright future ahead with eight more lives left. In the 1972 Olympics, a certain breed of dog was chosen as mascot. Can you guess which breed? The Greyhound, the Great Dane, the Dachshund, or the Dalmatian? Find out after this. Welcome back to Pets in Paradise TV. So what breed was the 1972 Olympic mascot? If you pick the Dachshund, you're right. In fact, they even built the marathon course in the shape of a Dachshund. And now it's time to learn more about the Dachshund. Everybody loves those little short-legged, long-bodied dogs that we refer to as a wiener dog, the Dachshund. Their size and shape may be humorous, but there's a reason. Dachshund is a German breed that literally means badger dog. They were originally bred to hunt burrowing animals like badgers, prairie dogs, rabbits, and other small prey. They come in three sizes, standard, miniature, and kamichen, a German word meaning little rabbit. The most common though are the standards and miniatures that weigh from eight to 11 pounds. Dachshunds make great competitors and often compete in dachshund races, including the Wiener Nationals. Writer H.L. Mencken once said that a dachshund is half a dog high and a dog and a half long. They come in three types of coats, short hair, long hair, and wire hair, and come in a variety of patterns and colors, although the most popular is red. Dachshunds are excellent pets and are listed as the seventh most popular breed. They're fun-loving, loyal, and are good apartment dwellers. Because they love to be around people, they can get bored and are notorious for chewing things if left alone for long periods of time. They thrive on companionship and seldom display shyness. Because of their breeding as hunting animals, dachshunds can be stubborn and are known for their propensity for chasing prey, including tennis balls, with great determination. They can also be aggressive to strangers and to other dogs. Their bark can be loud and persistent. Training is helpful, but because of their stubborn nature, it can be a challenge. In their home country of Germany, they're loved by everyone and are considered a national symbol. 
The dachshund was even made the official mascot of the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich. And now you know all about the dachshund. Up next, we explore the relationship between a polo horse and its rider. Right, ladies and gentlemen, the beginning of the Battle in the Saddle for 2012 is just about ready to get underway. It's a sport that dates back to the first century. It's a game of skill, danger, precision, and horses. In this segment, we take a closer look at the game of polo and go behind the scenes to find out just what this game is made of. You know, this is the beginning of the polo season and it's an absolutely spectacular day. Polo was popularized by the British and has made its way to the islands. Today, opening day, we've got probably a thousand people here. It's been a long-standing tradition on Oahu's North Shore since 1965. Polo is a sport of kings, but uh, none of us are kings. They may not be kings, but this royal sport was said to have originated in Persia and picked up by the Byzantine Empire. Although it can be dangerous, it's also a sport full of elegance and grace. And this is the first game of the season, so I'm nervous. But today is just a friendly game, and we go together with friends, we just play. He's excitable, huh? Yeah. <laughs> He's anxious to get going. And how does this game get going? Let's get a quick lesson from former Honolulu Mayor Peter Carlisle. So what's going to happen is I'm going to take this ball, and it's about the size of a, a hard ball, and uh, although it's sort of waxy, and I'm going to roll it around a number of people like this and a beautiful horse like this who's a little bit skittish, and then what will happen is they'll be lined up in the middle, horses facing horses with riders, and I'll pitch this ball out like that, and that will begin the first chuck. Is that correct? Chucker. The first chucker, all right? All right, the game is off and underway. These polo ponies can stop on a dime, give you a change for a quarter. The game is played on a field 200 yards long by 300 yards wide, the size of almost 10 football fields. In this game, there are two teams of four. Just like football, there are goals on each side of the field. Each goal is 24 feet wide. And the object is to hit the ball through the goal, just like any other sport, like soccer. So the line of the ball in polo is the most important rule that we have. Whatever player last hits the ball, could be forward, could be backwards, to the side, whatever direction that ball was just hit, that's the new direction of the ball. That's the new line of the ball. And so every player on the field has to respect that line and go with the line. You can't like cross the line. Now let's take a look at what you need to play polo. You need a mallet. This is a polo mallet. They uh, are made out of a cane and a hardwood head. The object is to hit the ball dead center where the cane meets the head. You need courage. Literally, we get up to speeds of about 35 to 40 miles an hour. And on a thousand pound animal chasing a little white ball with other guys trying to do the same thing, uh, it gets pretty hairy out there. And you need a good horse. Yeah, a good horse that will take you there, you focus on the ball, and then that's how the game moving fast and forward. The right side of the horse is the offside, and that's your typical forward shot. That's the offside. Okay, now on this side, the left side is the near side, same shot going forward or back. Teamwork there, Devin taking that ball up, trying to come through the traffic, keeps the ball in front of himself. Here comes uh, it's Chris Dawson with the next shot. He tries to get there in time, but it's wide. Let's take a behind the scenes look at how these athletes prepare for game day. Okay, well, grooming is such an important job because our players don't have enough time to do this themselves. Uh, a groom should do all of the cleaning and equipment because your player's life depends on it, Aaron. If anything is loose or broken, it's the groom's responsibility to let the player know. So basically, what we try to do here is make sure we're taking care of the horses and preparing them for the game. It's the best job I could hope for. Out of the pack comes Brian Laporte turning the ball with that horse that he loves riding. And in this sport, it's all about the horse. The way you can tell if a horse loves the game is that if you're neck and neck with your opponent going for a ride off, which is a legal move to uh, remove somebody from the line of the ball, uh, your horse will either shy away from it 
but this horse, she wants to bump, so she will actually go and bump the other horse and make a face. They constitute 70% of the game, the riders 30% of the game. You know, the horses gotta love the game or else they you can't get them to play. If you don't take really good care of your horses or not happy, they won't play well. We're very lucky that we have horses that love this sport as much as we do. Come and prove it is Julian Alvarez, a beautiful 